We're going to do a bit of a shout out today. Um, the Bee Lady Apiary and um, Southern Ark Homestead. I'll link down to both of them in the channel. They're both beekeepers, and in this episode, I'm going to be covering specifically for the Bee Lady my top bar hives and what they are and why they're done the way they are and how I've arranged them. So let's get this party started. All right, so it would appear that not a lot of people know about my type of hive. So I thought I'd do a rundown of them. I've just taken the tops off of them and opened them up a little bit. There's no bees in them, but um, there's a couple of wasps underneath the top and I just wanted to give them an opportunity to run away before I start messing with them. So let me... Okay, so let's give a discussion about this. These are called top bar beehives. They were invented in the 1960s by an entomologist in Canada. The idea behind them actually comes from ancient Greece and ancient Rome in the way that they kept bees. The design of the hives was such that they can literally be made out of just about anything. They're very simple to make. Um, the two that you see here I made out of six wood pallets that I got for free. So really there's almost no money in them. They're designed with top bars. The top bars look like this. The dimension here is what's important going across. Then you center, and this is, this is referred to as a cleat, you center the cleat on it so that the bars when they're in line up in such a way so when the bees build comb which hangs down the spacing between the cleats leaves enough space that there's a, a proper bee space between each of the two combs. Now, these hives have what are called backer boards in them, which is this piece here. So this piece here is a backer board. That's used to reduce the size of the hive. The hive itself's entrance is on that end. So from that end of the backer board is, uh, based on my calculations, about 43 liters of space, which is what bees look for when they move in. So the entomologist that invented these did so, and in such a way that you can make them out of just about anything. But he did it because in third world countries, when they keep bees, they tend to put a log up and put a hole, hollow out a log, put a hole in it. When the bees move in, they let the bees build out their hive. They then split the log, kill the bees, and take all the honey. And he was attempting to come up with a way that they could have a renewable honey source that didn't cost much. And if you've done beekeeping, and, um, well, some of you have, Langstroth hives, which are the standard box hives that are used in commercial beekeeping, are relatively expensive. These cost me nothing. Uh, I take that back. I got about $20 in parts in the two of them. So, what I'm attempting to do is to keep that front section of each hive right at about 40 liters, just a little over 40 liters, in the hopes that I can get a wild bee swarm to move in. Or commercial bees, when you purchase them, have been raised in the Langstroth hives, and I should state that through my research, one of the biggest problems that they're finding with the Langstroth hives is when you put in the wax board on the frame that has the cells marked on it, because the bees follow that mark. Well, those cells are actually bigger than what a bee would normally make. Most commercial bees are about twice as large as wild bees, and it's predominantly because of that preform. Um, it was worked up years ago to that size to maximize honey production. And several entomologists actually believe that the larger cell size and the larger bee size is what's causing 
the problem with mites and requiring the treatment for a variety of other things, the fungus treatments, etc. So, based on my research, these hives actually don't have the problem if you get catch wild bees that you have in commercial hives, in that you don't actually have to treat the bees, you can leave them alone and let them do their thing. These type hives are predominantly used through South America and Africa in third world countries because they're cheap to make. I said they could be made out of anything. I've actually watched videos where people made them by weaving cane and made the bottom portion and then cut the top bars out of wood. I've seen them where they've cut a drum, a plastic drum in half and made top bars, bars for it and drilled a hole in the end of it and raised bees in them that way. So there's a million and one ways you could do this. There's no set size. The only real set size is the distance across the top bar. Anything else is up to you. You can make them square, um, or you can make them in this trapezoid pattern that I'm doing. The trapezoid pattern is most common because the bees like to leave that bee space. They never connect the, or they normally do not connect the comb to the side of the hive. So, so when they've got bees in them and you go to remove one, you have to lift it straight out like this. In, especially in South America and Africa, where they're dealing with aggressive Africanized bees, rather than opening up like a Langstroth hive, where you get that great big open spot on top, you've opened an area here that's an inch and a half roughly. And what I've seen some of the third world country, people in third world countries do when they have aggressive bees, is one person will take the comb out and the other person will lay a damp rag across the hole because the moisture from the rag helps calm the bees down. And that stops them from swarming out the way they would with a Langstroth hive. That's the basics of these. Now, once you get them in, it's best to put a cover board on them, like you would with uh, any other hive. Keep the rain off the top of it. And then you want to set something on top of that to weight it down so it doesn't just blow off. Let me take a look at this other hive. Harvesting from these type hives is done by removing the top bar, positioning the comb over a bucket, and cutting the comb loose with a knife. You harvest comb and all. Um, and in most instances with the comb, you crush the comb to extract the honey. The bees will naturally order the hive. Um, by that I mean that the first couple of bars will be um, pollen, then you get into the brood area of it, and that will go for however many bars. It depends on the size of the hive. And then everything at the back of the hive will be honey and honey stores. Most people that use these types of hives and most of the instructions on them, especially for third world countries, suggest that you not harvest everything and that you harvest actually less than half of the honey that's in the hive at any given point so that the bees have enough to get them through the winter, which winter here is very mild compared to up north. So for the most part, one beekeeper that I spoke to who's west of me, who does these types of hives, suggested that uh, he only leaves about eight or nine bars of honey in the hive to get through winter. And it, you, it's usually good. For me, I figured I'd take five or six bars out, leave them the rest. Um, I'm not looking at doing this as a commercial production. If I can get wild bees to move into one, after about a year, I will, or once the hive is big enough, I will split the hive and make two. If I can get it up to where I've got six active hives on the property, then I qualify for the agricultural tax exemption for the property taxes, which is a big plus. But I'd have to have six hives. Um, all in all, it didn't cost me a whole lot to make. If I can get wild bees to move in, great. If not, well, it was worth a try. If I don't get any bees this spring, 
or maybe before this spring, I'll uh, make a swarm box and put another swarm box up someplace in the back of the property. See if I can get some bees to move into a swarm box. When I built these, the, uh, the instructions I followed created what are considered observational hives. The bottom board drops down, there's a screen there, and you can lay down underneath and look up at the bees as they do their job on the comb. Um, if I had this to do again, I would leave those off, that's for sure. I'd basically nail the board in place and probably leave a gap on the board for the holes to get in. I drilled three three-quarter inch holes across the front and uh, I put a little strip on it. Uh, we'll call it a landing strip. I'll grab the camera here. Just like that. So they've got an entry hole and a place to land. Now, the stuff that I read suggested that they face east or southeast. This is southeast direction. It faces pretty much the rising sun which rises over here and arcs across the sky. Um, if you notice the field in front where the pump is, the oil pump is, all of that in spring is flowering. Um, I planted most of what's in there just from uh, deer feed or deer food plot seed. But you, as you can tell, even now in October, there's lots of flowers out there, lots of white flowers. Out behind here is a big power line run. And it runs miles that way and miles that way, and you may be able to see the Deer blind for my neighbor. This whole area, actually, you should be able to see some yellow flowers down there too. This whole area during spring is all wildflowers, for as far as you can see. And there are always bees coming and going from this area. If you have any questions, let me know. Be more than happy to answer them. When you bait a hive, basically what I gathered from the instructions on the baiting top bar hives is that you rub the inside of the hive down with natural beeswax, which I did. I rubbed all the top bars down and I rubbed all of the base down. And then you put a few drops of lemongrass oil in it and you need to refresh that about once a month. So that's what I do to bait the hives.